So I'm going to cross a line today. In the past I haven't really used the word brainwashing before. In one post I used it to say that certain ways that certain people reacted at the time I came out of the closet made me think that they were brainwashed, but that I was not yet ready to jump to the conclusion that they were. But since that time, I've read a lot more about, about brainwashing, about psychology, about um, social influence and pressure, persuasion, and, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, brainwashing is an appropriate word. I think one reason why Mormons really, really dislike this word being used um, is that everybody has this image. The word brainwashing has a lot of baggage with it. You have this image of uh, maybe prisoners of war being brainwashed through violent means. And certainly, certainly the LDS Church is not guilty of that. Their, their violent methods of brainwashing. Um, and as far as I know, as far as I know, there's none of that going on anywhere in the LDS Church. I was never exposed to any violent treatments. But there is heavy-handed social pressure uh, particularly in Utah, there is extreme pressure for young men when they turn the age of 19. They, they are expected to serve a full-time mission uh, for two years for the LDS Church. Uh, this is, there, there's extreme, extreme social pressure to the point that basically everybody you know will ask you, you know, even, even when you're at about 18 and a half, starting then, people will ask you, oh, when are you going to go on your mission? When are you putting in your papers? When are you sending in your application? And if you reach age 19 or 20 and you still haven't gone, people are asking you, when, when are you going to go? Are you, are you going to go on a mission? And, and if you don't go, there's, I mean, ostracism. I mean, people will actually judge you for the fact that you didn't go. Uh, I know because one of my brothers didn't. And my little brother, I remember he didn't go until he was about 20, and, uh, and he was getting a lot of judgment from people. Um, and that's probably one of the most obvious ways where there's pressure. But um, aside from just the social pressure of, you know, you need to be like everybody else in the church, you have to do what everybody else in the church is doing, the, the structure of the church itself, the actual church administration, does, I believe, engage in mind control by, um, by dictating to members what they should think, and what they should learn, and what they should not learn, what they should avoid, what they should uh, not do. And this is most distinctly seen in the Temple Recommend interview. So, when you're a member of the, of the Mormon Church, you, you don't automatically get to go into the Mormon Temple. You need to be, uh, you need to be at least well, if you're if you're getting married, then you know you have well you have to be at least 18. Obviously, to get to get married, you need to be 18. So you either need to be getting married or you need to be uh, going on uh, an LDS mission. Or later on in life, if you've if you still haven't done either one of those, they 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 might just let you go anyway. But but anyway, there are certain requirements, and uh, and before you can go. You need to have an interview with your local church leader, your bishop, and the leader that's just above him, that's still a local leader, but a little bit uh, more general, so more of a, a, a bigger region. So you need an inter a second interview with the stake president. And both these interviews are identical. They will ask exactly the same questions. Um, and I think 
the fact that there are two interviews and the second one is with a higher up is just to apply more pressure, uh, you know, to uh, to make you feel like you really you really need to um, take this seriously, and and it is a lot of pressure. Um, but this is why I think that it can be called brainwashing is because they're telling you specifically what you need to think, what you need to think, and things that you need to avoid. So here are a few of the questions. There are several. I won't read all of them because not all of them pertain. But um, the first one, do you have faith in and a testimony of God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? Now, that's pretty much a given if you're a Christian. Do you believe in you believe in those. Of course, if you're Mormon, you believe that there's three separate beings, and if you're a non-Mormon Christian, you might believe that they're all the same person. Okay, number two, do you have a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ and his role as Savior and Redeemer? Three, do you have a testimony of the restoration of the gospel in these latter days? And what that means is you believe that Joseph Smith did uh, receive revelation from God, that he saw God and Jesus Christ, and that he was called as a prophet to restore the gospel that was on the earth when Jesus was here, but was lost because of the great apostasy, which took place basically from around 100 uh, AD until 1820, when Joseph Smith saw God. Um, number four, do you sustain the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints so currently that's Thomas S. Monson, as the prophet, seer, and revelator, and as the only person on earth who possesses and is authorized to exercise all priesthood keys. Do you sustain members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators? Do you sustain the other general authorities and local authorities of the Church? So they're telling you specifically you need you need to obey these people. You need to believe that there's this one man in all of the earth that can talk to God and tell us what God is saying. And then there's also behavior control. There's do you live the law of chastity? Do you, um, do you live the word of wisdom, which means you don't drink alcohol, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, you don't drink tea or coffee? Um, so there's behavior control in there as well. Um, number six, is there anything in your conduct relating to members of your family that is not in harmony with the teachings of the church? Even what you do in your own home is monitored. You can't do things with your own family unless they're in harmony with the teachings of the church. This is mind control. This is behavior control. This is brainwashing. Okay, and this is the real kicker for me. This is one that I think is really blatantly obvious. Mind control. Do you support, affiliate with, or agree with any group or individual whose teachings or practices are contrary to or oppose those accepted by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? any individual or group who disagrees with the church. You're not supposed to be friends with people whose teachings are contrary to those of the church. Basically, <laughs> basically, any Mormon friends I have that read my blog or watch my videos anymore can't say yes to this question because my views oppose those of the LDS Church. Mine are contrary to those of the LDS Church. And what they're saying here is, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to read things that contradict the LDS Church. This is mind control. This is, this is the Church telling you, you can't think for yourself. You need to believe what the church tells you. You have to do what the church says. And if you're reading things that say that the church is wrong, we're going to punish you. 
that's that's mind control right there that is that is brainwashing no it is not the strongest form of brainwashing it's not violent uh, but it is telling people what to think what to read who to associate with what organizations they can participate in because if they're part of an organization that disagrees with the LDS Church, they can't have a temple recommend. They can't go and receive their saving ordinances that they get in the temple. So I think just that alone, yes, there are lots of other things, lots of other things, but just that alone, I think, is plenty of evidence to say for sure, yes, the LDS Church is guilty of brainwashing. And that's why I say, be careful. Be careful. If you are associated with the LDS Church, if you have missionaries come visit you, be careful. Because everybody, everyone, is susceptible to brainwashing. Nobody's mind is strong enough that you can resist. They're... The reason brainwashing works is because people know human nature and they take advantage of it. People want approval. People want to fit in. And so the church says, okay, we'll give you approval. We'll, you can fit in here. You have a home here. This is your family. People like the idea of family. These are your brothers and sisters that you can associate with. But, but, if you want to be part of this family, you need to think this, and you need to do this, and this is how you need to live your life. And these are the things you need to do. And these are the things you need to believe. These are the things you need to think. And these are things you need to avoid. You cannot read this. You cannot go visit this person. You cannot interact with that group. You can't join that organization because they disagree with us. That's mind control. That's behavior control. And it's brainwashing. And yeah, there, there are lots of others. There's, of course, I mean, even just the, the recitations that they do and the singing hymns and the testimony meeting every month um, and, and, you know, and indoctrinating children and letting children as young as eight years old um, decide whether they want to be baptized and, and join the church. Yeah, I think I think they're brainwashing. But I'm not going to stop there. I, I don't think it's just the LDS Church. I think lots of other churches um, are guilty of many of the same things. I would say the LDS Church is not special in that it wants you to deny anything that disagrees with its own doctrine. Lots of other churches will ask you to do that. That's one reason why I was very impressed when I went to visit the Unitarian Universalist Church because they're very open-minded. They have um, Buddhist people speak. They have um, Catholic preachers and pastors. The time that I went, uh, they had several speakers, and one of the speakers was an atheist. And, and at the Unitarian Church, belief in God is optional. If you want to believe in him, great. If you don't want to believe, that's fine. You want to believe in the Christian God or the Muslim God, the Jewish God. You want to believe in... I bet that even let you believe in the Greek gods or the Egyptian gods or any god that you want to believe in. Or no god at all. And, and I don't think they'd have a problem with that. And to me, that's, that actually does fit with their... With their um, their name, Unitarian. They want everybody to be united. In the LDS Church, the way they, they say, if ye are not one, ye are not mine. And the way they try to achieve unity is to make everybody the same. This is the mold you have to fit in. You need to go on a mission when you're 19. You need to get married when you get home from your mission when you're 21 or 22. You need to have children as soon as you get married. Um, 
there's a mold that you have to fit. You know, you have to you have to eat these foods and don't eat those foods. And that's how they achieve unity. And and it doesn't work because people are different. I mean, you you might be okay not drinking tea, but maybe somebody else really likes tea. Drink tea. You know, and and maybe you want to get married, maybe you don't want to get married. Don't get married. Maybe you want to go on a mission, maybe you don't want to go on a mission. Well, don't go on a mission if you don't want to. Think for yourself, be yourself, be your own person, and don't let an organization control you. So, that's, that's all I have to say.